Good morning. I'm Rosemary Pena, founder and president of the Black German Heritage and Research Association. I am also adjunct professor of German studies at the University of British Columbia at Vancouver in the Department of Central, Eastern, and Northern European Studies. Dr. Emily Fraser Rath, our students at Davidson College, and I welcome you to our virtual classroom. This morning's conversation represents the 17th event in the BGHRA's All Black Lives Matter series and the 11th produced in collaboration with Davidson College. As bilateral exchange between university students in North America and Germany is a critical part of our BGHRA mission, our aim is today to exemplify this concept in the virtual realm. We are therefore delighted to host Basiru Kamara as our featured guest for what will officially be our last class of the fall semester. As we at the BGHRA advance our initiatives to include decolonizing study abroad curricula, Basiru, who just also happens to be my nephew, has graciously consented to be our BGHRA student ambassador in Berlin. We are thrilled and honored to have him join us this morning and look forward to working with him as we further develop our exchange program. Once you meet Basiru, I can assure you that you will understand why we're so happy to be working with him. He knows quite a bit about studying abroad. The personal connection is merely an added bonus. So in the interest of time, and because we're all eager to be in conversation with him, I'll now ask Emily if she would kindly thank our sponsors, share a little about our work together with you, and then formally introduce today's special guest. Emily? Thank you, Rosemary. <clears throat> we are so excited to be able to invite Basiro Kamara to our class, to Davidson College, and to the BGHRA today. Today is November 23rd, 2021, and we, Dr. Pena, me, and our eight Davidson students in our class are in our 13th and final official, or 13th week in our final official class uh, day together in German 231 entitled Black German Art and Resistance. As I mentioned at the beginning of our conversations with our guests, all of our guests this semester, Dr. Pena and I co-teach this class together. The class consists of three parts. It is first a survey course in the field of Black German studies. Second, it is a community-based learning course as we support the BGHRA through our work and will feature our final projects, which we're super excited about, on the BGHRA archive. And it is more, most, most importantly, an opportunity for students and through these recordings, our broader BGHRA and Davidson communities to speak with people whose lives and work intersect with, influence, shape, and inform Black German studies. We'd like to thank the Dean Rusk International Studies Program Speakers Fund for helping to sponsor today's event. In particular, I would like to thank former Dean Rusk Program Director James Zimmerman and the former Dean Rusk Program Administrator Sheila Reeves for their support, as well as Verna Case, the Interim Director of the Dean Rusk Program for her continued support. I want to thank the Department of German Studies Administrator, Meg Sawicki, as well as Jennifer Joyce and Susan Caldwell, who work behind the scenes here at Davidson doing all the logistical and organizational work um, and whose patience with me, as always, I greatly appreciate. Finally, Rosemary and I would like to thank our students in Black German Art and Resistance for all of your thoughtful questions, your curiosity and your hard work this semester and beyond. So thank you, Denai, Katie, Kari, Garrett, Gavin, Pat, Raphael, and Stephen. You'll meet some of our students um, in more depth uh, today as they introduce themselves more thoroughly to our guest and to you, and be on the lookout for their projects upcoming on the website um, over this winter break. It is an honor to introduce Basiro Kamara to our class for a very special conversation. Basiro uh, is 22 years old, a Senegalese, um, of a Senegalese and German descent, and was born and raised in Berlin. 
He graduated from a French German binational high school and after graduation began studying economics at Humboldt University in Berlin and currently studies Chinese studies and business administration at Freie Universität Berlin. From 2018 to 2019, he spent a year abroad in Seoul, South Korea, as he worked for the German school Seoul International, which is a private international school accredited by the German government. Currently, he also volunteers for Africa Elects, which is an organization that focuses on poll aggregation and election analysis in Africa. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this conversation over to Basiru and our wonderful students. Okay, thank you and uh, hello everyone. Um, I'm excited to be here and also thank you for the invitation. For me, it's my first, um, how to say, uh, cross universitarian <laughs> uh, talk. Um, so um, to start, um, I, I didn't have a normal, um, I wasn't raised like most Germans in Germany because I went to a French German school, which is not actually a private international school like the school I later worked for. Uh, so because my parents are both Senegalese, or to be more specific, my mom is half German, half Senegalese, but she was raised uh, in Senegal and Morocco. And my father is half Guinean, half Senegalese, but he was raised in Senegal. And so they both speak French. And um, in Germany, there's this thing called the Elysee Treaty, which is a treaty between France and Germany because of the um, because after World War II, Germany and France, they thought about um, um, how to say um, I'm close in their relationships because most of the history has been war. And so after World War II, they sat together and they made a big treaty, which is still celebrated um, every year in February. And um, because of this, there's a new type of school that exists both in France and Germany called European state schools, which are not private schools, but government schools in which students learn um, different subjects in French and German. For example, I had music in French, PE in German, history in French, math in German. And technically the idea is that we leave school and get both degrees, like the Fr German Abitur and the French Baccalauréat. It's called Abibac. Um, and yeah, that also, um, an interesting thing that happens there is there's no, there's no rule that you have to be, for example, um, French to, to go into these schools. Basically, anyone can go in. You just have to prove that you have some connection with either France or the French language. Uh, and by the way, if you have any questions or you want to uh, say something, you can just, I, I don't mind. And um, yeah, and so even though I wasn't French and my parents weren't French either, I could go to the school because I have a connection with the French language through my parents. And these schools for me were also interesting because Germany doesn't have a huge black population like uh, France does or the United Kingdom because uh, German colonialism ended very soon after World War I when France and the UK had continued for long. And so uh, German schools uh, logically don't have that many black students, but it was different in my school because a lot of um, um, families who come from, for example, former French colonies such as uh, Senegal, Mali, or the Congo who come to Germany also send their kids to these schools. So my school was a bit more diverse than the average German school. Though after I finished middle school and went to high school, um, the school I went to it was still a European state school, but was part of a, of a larger German school. So I was part of two classes, which are French, while the rest of the school is just German. <laughs> and um, yeah. Uh, I also wanted to uh, talk briefly about um, what my experience was with uh, Black Lives Matter in Germany. 
because for me, um, these issues like black liberation and uh, et cetera are interesting from a German perspective because uh, I would say in Germany, black people also feel um, sometimes or most of the times um, not being represented fairly in, in many um, branches of life. But as the population is relatively small compared to, for example, the US there has never been a big movement. There has been a prominent organization that uh, was founded in the 90s. It's called the Amadeo Antonio Stiftung, which was founded after in the 90s an Angolan worker was uh, killed in, in Brandenburg. And that was, in my opinion, one of the first big organizations which try to tackle these issues. And um, yeah, I think um, sometimes I, I have to laugh when my German friends, or not, not just Germans, but Europeans dismiss American cultural and media influence on Europe, because um, um, for example, um, my friends always say, yeah, America doesn't have any culture and they don't have any influence when it comes to culture. But I would say my life in Germany is not as different as yours, especially because we're of similar age. I watch Netflix. I use social media like Instagram or Twitter, which are all American. And people here also listen to American music, my parents too. And um, what I found interesting was how Black Lives Matter in the U.S., heavily influenced Black Lives Matter in Germany, especially after uh, the George Floyd killing last year, because um, by then Black Lives Matter already existed in Germany, but it was really, really small and no one really paid attention to. And I remember vividly when in 2000, wait, that was last year, right? Yeah, in 2020, uh, when this movement um, um, became international, also, they registered a demonstration in the capital here in Berlin, and I went there with my family, and it was one of the biggest protests I've ever seen, and which means a lot because Berlin is a city with a lot of protests. I, I think we have 40 protests each day <laughs> happening here, um, some smaller, of course, but that was very interesting, and it was also a big issue for a few weeks in the country because people have never seen this much people being invested in minority rights um, in this country in the modern modern era. And also that happened during uh, the Corona crisis. I mean, we still are in it, but uh, was the first big protest during the lockdown. So there was also a lot of opposition to it from people who said, yeah, I support the movement, but maybe we should wait a few months. Um, yeah, then it happened. But in my opinion, sadly, nothing really came out of it because it felt like there weren't very strong, how to say, um, the advocacy felt a bit more general and didn't tackle specific issues. And it feels like right now, if you watch the news, if you look at uh, the, don't know if you know this, but currently we have a second migrant crisis in the EU between the border of Belarus and Poland in which many refugees try to cross the border to come to Germany and Germany of course doesn't want this to happen so they support Poland and um, other European countries in stopping people from coming over um, with the same rhetoric which they criticized last time this happened which is funny because now they do the opposite of what they actually try to do. Um, so it does feel sadly like we are regressing a bit. And yeah, in I am very interested, as you probably noticed, in politics in Germany, but also on an international scale. And my first um, experience with politics was when I joined a youth organization in 2016 or 17, I think. It was a few months before the last, not the last, but the last election in 2017. And for a party, which I disagree today, but um, I did it and it was really fun. And it um, gave me also um, 
gave me a lot of perspective on how politics and elections work in Germany. And um, hopefully I will be working in the Bundestag next month if I'm lucky. And, uh, but that's another story. But um, also after that, um, um, I think it was 2019, I was about to do my Abitur, which is the German high school diploma. And I didn't want to go straight from school to university. I wanted to go for a year abroad. And so I applied for many things and many things didn't work out, but I also applied for um, an internship, a paid internship for the German school in Seoul. And yeah, I got, I got the job, spoiler alert. And um, which was exciting for me because I, uh, the farthest away I went from Germany was Senegal where my parents came from. And yeah, other than that, I just traveled through Europe and I never had any, um, how to say, connection with any Asian countries. I've never visited an Asian country and I didn't know what to expect. And I didn't know what they expected because black Germans are already rare. So what is a black German in South Korea? And then in August 2019, I moved to South Korea, uh, which was a very interesting experience on multiple, multiple issues. Um, for example, I was the only person in the entire school and the school went from from not only first grade, but from kindergarten to high school. So it was um, spread out on all um, all the on all branches, especially because um, Germany has a lot of these schools, I think over 150, which exist for everywhere in Namibia and China and Taiwan and Bolivia. And the idea behind it is that German students, uh, Germans who have who work in these countries, for example, for companies like Lufthansa or the Deutsche Bank, et cetera, and who have children there um, have an opportunity to give their children also German education. Uh, also for all the children of people who work in the in the embassies or um, also we had a lot of Koreans in the school who whose parents used to work in Germany or um, have some connection to Germany. Uh, usually it's because in the 60s and 70s a lot of South Koreans used to work in Germany for um, especially in the car industry or as nurses and for me, it was interesting because I was the only non-white, non-Korean person who worked at the at the school. Uh, so for me, it was a different environment because I come from Berlin, which is comparatively to the rest of Germany still diverse. Uh, and um, for me, it was also weird. I realized because in Germany, I usually get the common question: "Where are you actually from?" Implying that I'm or I'm only partial. That's also a reason why I somehow sometimes dislike the idea of saying I'm half German, half Senegalese, because I have a German citizenship. I have a full citizenship. I don't have half of it. I have the entire thing. And I went to school here. Um, but uh, usually when people ask this, they, I know they just want to know where my parents are from, but then they sort of take implications from that and push them on me. But it was different in South Korea because people only asked where you're from. And I said, Germany. And then it was basically settled, which was new to me because then I was confronted with stereotypes about Germans, which I didn't have in Germany because everyone else was more German than me. <laughs> so in South Korea, I often got questions about cars or about engineering, which I was not prepared for. Um, I used to live in a district in Seoul called Yongsan, which is uh, known for having the biggest military base, American military base in South Korea. So there's also in the district a lot of uh, African Americans who work for the American military. So when I got to Korea, uh, one of my roommates who was Korean told me to not shave my um, not to shave my hair because of my hair is too short. Everyone is going to think that I'm an American soldier. And in Seoul, American soldiers are very unpopular. <laughs> so that was also interesting to me. And I think a lot of people probably thought I was an American soldier or associated with them, uh, which was not the case. And um, 
And also the reason American soldiers are unpopular in Seoul is not because of politics or because of any type of, I think, racism. It's in general because they have a bad reputation in the district because it's a party district and the American base is there. So sometimes they sneak out during the night and um, they, um, yeah, and they have just a bad reputation. So sometimes when I go out uh, in Itaewon and Seoul at night, um, we have American military officers in South Korea who, um, who always check my identity just to see whether I'm an American who works for the military who just doesn't want to work right now. So I often got one interesting experience was when an American soldier came up to me and he was like, ID please. And I said, I'm German. And he said, oh, Sie sprechen Deutsch, ich auch. And I was like, yeah. And he was like, Ausweis bitte, ID please. And I was like, oh, come on. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, I also felt sometimes they told me that especially taxi drivers dislike American soldiers. So sometimes I felt like, you know, there's a stereotype around the world that if you go into a taxi, taxi drivers talk a lot, which I, I mean, I had this experience a lot of times, but in South Korea, sometimes the taxi drivers wouldn't talk to me at all. And because I was outgoing in South Korea, because I didn't know anybody, I tried to talk to them also to, um, um, to, to practice my Korean. And the moment they realized I wasn't American, but German, they got really talky and they they tried to talk to me about the wall and how South Korea and Germany are very similar and how this car is a BMW or Volkswagen and I wanted to talk about cars. Um, I remember one once I came late to an event and the problem was a taxi driver didn't want to let me out of the taxi when we reached the, the location because he still wanted to hold his monologue about how he loves German cars. <laughs> And that was new to me because I was never confronted with German stereotypes because in Germany, yeah, makes no sense to, <laughs> to do that. Um, I remember being, I was very anxious when I moved to South Korea because I saw, I, I went to YouTube and I watched videos about how do black, pe black people feel in South Korea because uh, when it comes to being in the public, I'm a bit, um, how to say, I'm, I'm a person who's a bit more shy. So if I'm in a country with a population of like 0.01% Black people, then I guess I'm a novelty to many people. So I was very scared at first. But I think some of the videos were a bit outdated because Seoul is a huge modern city and they usually experience black people. Um, I do, did realize that when I left the city, sometimes people would stare at me. <laughs> that was new to me. Um, I also took the opportunity when I was in South Korea because I worked for a German school, meaning that I have the same um, holidays as a German school in Germany, which is amazing because as you know, South Korea isn't that strong with labor laws. <laughs> um, so I use the opportunity to travel around Asia, for example, Hong Kong, Singapore, Thailand, Cambodia, um, China, and see how life is there. Um, and I was, I, I must say, I was surprised by how well people welcomed me because I was afraid when I traveled first. For example, in Japan, I didn't feel like there was anything malicious um, in the air. Same in Thailand, which is also a very diverse country, or Taipei. I did experience, however, when I was in Shanghai, that was for work, uh, for the school. Uh, we went to the city center and um, people, as I walked through the city center, people would pull out their phone and make pictures of me or film me, or they just came up to me to talk to me. Um, Though that didn't make me feel anxious because it was so weird. That was actually a funny experience. And uh, as other Chinese people explained to me that these people aren't native Shanghainese people, but Chinese tourists from more rural areas in which foreigners basically don't exist. So for them, I'm like, I'm like, like it's like part of the sightseeing for them to see foreigners. 
especially black people. And um, I also had some people try to touch me to look if my skin uh, goes white if they rub it, which is of course not how uh, skin works. But, <laughs> but it was for me, it was a funny experience. Um, I would say as someone who grew up in Europe, who traveled a lot through Europe, um, I realized early that many European countries aren't that different from each other, like fundamentally from when it comes to culture especially when you go to a country like Senegal. But also when I went to South Korea, I realized, okay, the cultural distance is, it is there, it's obvious, but it's not that big because it's still, so it's still a huge city. But when I went to China was the first time in my life, I actually felt like a real foreigner, like an alien. <laughs> and that was also what excited me about their culture, language and politics, politics which led to me later now studying uh, Chinese studies at the FU, at the Freie Universität. And um, yeah, in South Korea, I had very interesting experience. I remember once I walked home from work and there was a black guy passing me and he walked up to me and he was like, um, hey, what's up? I'm from Atlanta. Where are you from? And I said, I'm from Germany. And he was like, oh, okay. And then he left. <laughs> which was a very, I think one of the oddest conversations I've ever had in my life because nothing there could have been expected. Um, I assumed that he was an American, who uh, African-American who newly came to South Korea and I might have been the first black person he saw here. So he wanted to talk to me and the moment he realized I'm not American, he didn't want to talk to me because I, couldn't relate to him in a, on a cultural basis. I don't know if that's true, but that's how, what I think happened there because he really got uninterested the moment he realized I'm from Germany and not from America. Um, yeah. And what was also surprising is that in South Korea, because of my hair, um, I also tried to go to places uh, in which they can they know how to cut my hair, which are usually um, owned by uh, African people, especially Nigerians, and they are not that few in South Korea. This this I didn't expect, and I also remember that when my sister visited me in South Korea, she used to have dreadlocks. When she visited me, a lot of people tried to touch her hair, <laughs> and also when we went, for example, to a Nike store, the store. We would like pay and everything. And then the cashier would say, hey, can I touch your hair? She would say, no, of course not. Or people in the train just tried to touch her hair. But when I asked her about it, she told me that it's not that different in Berlin. But the thing is, I, I don't know how true that is. I can't relate because I don't have dreadlocks and I'm not female. So I don't know. Um, but when we came to South Korea, that was very obvious to me because she only stayed for a week and it happened like multiple times. Um, and um, also an interesting experience is in, especially European communities in other countries, because they are so small, they really try to, to be together, to have very tight communities. So in South Korea, there's this system called Elephant which is a system by the German government. So every German in South Korea is connected through, um, through email, through a sort of email newsletter, which also gives out invitations to German specific events. And once uh, every year, the German ambassador in South Korea invites basically all Germans in the country to come to his party at his, um, not his office, his residence which is huge, by the way, uh, his garden had two, um, um, how to say, how do you say Stockwerke in English? Uh, store floors. floors, yeah. Yeah, his, his garden, his, his garden had two floors, which was the first time and only time I've ever seen this. And when I went there, there were like a lot of people from the school, a lot of people from the embassy, uh, business people from Lufthansa, from continental German companies and um, other people. There are also other diplomats and people who are married to um, the German um, 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 diplomats, etc. And what I found was funny is that 
everyone on that party who wasn't from Germany assumed that I was German, but every German I met there assumed that I don't speak German. <laughs> um, and I think it has to do with the fact that like out of all the Germans who live in South Korea, that not that many people are non-white. Um, and with non-white, I don't mean just not black. I mean, really non-white. <laughs> And yeah, that was very interesting. Also, once I organized a soccer match between the German school in Seoul and the French school in Seoul. And the French school in Seoul is much, much, much bigger than the German one, uh, especially, I guess, because Belgian students uh, or from Tunisia, like from the embassies of Mali, Senegal, et cetera, also go to the French school. So naturally, that school is also bigger. And what was funny was when we had the football game, like three quarters of the French team was black, while 100% of the, or 50% of the German team was white or Korean, which I thought was very interesting. And um, yeah, so I took these experiences with me. And in August of 2000, of, 2020, uh, of 2019, I came back to Germany. Um, and before I went to study economics at Humboldt, I visited America, which was also for me, I don't like to say culture shock, but for, for I think for many Europeans, sometimes it's interesting to visit the US because as we are young, we watch American television, American movies. So we know how the country looks like and how the culture works, but it's weird for us to visit America because then we're confronted with our biases and uh, the re reality of being in America. Because for example, when I go to China, I don't have this issue because I didn't know how life is in China. I, I, don't, I didn't consume any Chinese media. Um, so I came to visit my cousin who studies in New York. And um, yeah, I mean, there are many things in America that which I was surprised with. Uh, the first thing I noticed, for example, is when I came from Newark Airport and went to and we went to Manhattan, the amount of um, highway uh, advertisements <laughs> that exist in America. I, I'm not used to this. In Germany, we don't have that many. I think they're even in some point illegal because of because people get distracted while they drive. And seeing advertisements for lawyers was a thing I didn't know exists because I actually don't know why we don't have this, but <laughs> I've never seen advertisements about lawyers in Germany, especially not on big posters or on TV. <laughs> and um, yeah, America was for me an interesting, a very interesting experience. I was just a block away from um, Harlem because my cousin studies at Columbia, which is very close to Harlem. And also interesting to me was that uh, Manhattan has a Senegalese district, Little Petit Senegal, which was interesting because as I walked in there and I heard people speaking Wolof, which is the native language of Senegalese people, was very exciting, but I don't know how to explain this. It felt interesting because I'm not used to hear, I, I'm used to hear it from my parents or when I went to Senegal, I wasn't expecting it in Manhattan, uh, but that was a very cool um, um, experience. And um, I didn't stay for long in America. Um, I think I was there for one and a half weeks. Uh, then I came back to Berlin and I went to university. Um, and after one and a half years, I switched to the Freie Universität. Uh, both, both universities are in Berlin. Technically, historically, they are even the same university. Um, the reason they split was because after World War II, after Berlin was split in two, uh, we had only the Universität zu Berlin. And nearly all of its buildings were in the cent city center which belonged to the east so so west berlin didn't have any university so they built a new one uh, with american help i think even i think it was an american general who even had the idea to found a new university and they called it also freie universität free university as opposed to the humboldt which is the communist <laughs> university and um 
yeah, nowadays they both exist. And because they're both so large, the, the government never um, really liked the idea of combining these two. So now we just have two big universities in the cities. And um, yeah, now I studied Chinese studies and um, business. And I work for an organization called Africa Elects. Uh, my job in that um, in that organization is I monitor um, um, political events or election results in Senegal, uh, especially because next year they have their municipal elections. And so I just write summaries and do graphics. And um, I think that's largely it from my part. Wow. Just so interesting wonderful thank you so much for sharing your whole story and i mean much of your story um i i'd like to invite the the students here with us today to um introduce yourselves and um and you know ask questions of our guests and um and just be in conversation so uh katie do you want to go first you're first on my screen yeah um i'm katie I'm from the US. Um, I've like lived here my whole life. And I went to a high school that was very like 40% international. So I know a lot about like different cultures, but I've never been out of the US. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. Um, yeah, I don't really know. I mean, I go to Davidson now, which is like not that far from my house relatively, but like a two hour flight. So that's fun. Um, and then I, I wanted to talk to you actually about when you're talking about Black Lives Matter and like how it didn't really solve anything or like, you know, didn't really do anything long term. Um, do you think that that was kind of just a performative thing? Because what seemed to, okay, what happened in the US, like where I was from at least, was that it was kind of, it blew up. And like a lot of people that I knew who cared about like, about anti racism in general were protesting but then there were some people who just kind of like hopped on the train I guess that sounds terrible to say but it was kind of like a thing and then it just kind of died out um at least that's what it seemed like from where I was in the U.S. and it seemed like something similar happened with you too I guess differently but um yeah did it seem like just more performative from like just people our age do you think um I think that's an interesting point I wouldn't call it performative because I do believe that was the sincere um, um, that the movement in itself was sincere and that people who work there are sincere in their in their political goals. Um, I felt like when I went to the protest, I did think about okay, how many of you are going to delete the BLM from the Instagram or Twitter profiles after two months, which probably happened. Um, what I felt also was that probably um, a lot of people who supported the movement aren't by themselves not that political. So they support the movement, they go to the protest, but when it gets to adv advocating for certain policies, these people aren't there anymore because they either don't know or are not interested in, in um, moving with that. Um, but I think a structural problem of the whole movement was that there were it it lacked um, political advocacy, like asking for specific things, uh, which I think is harder in Germany because, for example, America, for example, has a huge history with redlining and discrimination, and there are like black neighborhoods in America and white neighborhoods. I don't think that this really exists in Germany because the black population is relatively small compared to the rest. I mean, we do have specific neighborhoods in which are associated with different groups, but I don't think that we have a district in the country which is really associated with uh, black people. So the problems there are less associated with things like redlining, et cetera. So it's like things like, um, for example, I think, isn't it true that in America, if you apply for a job, you usually don't, have a picture of yourself on the application or never that's illegal yeah yeah in germany it's sort of the other way around in germany um it's expected that you always send a picture of yourself on the application <laughs> um i think in one state in north rhine westphalia i think that's even um um 
you have to do it, uh, which on the surface isn't that um, problematic, but it is because there are so many studies which show that if people see um, um, if people see that um, if you have two people, one being German and one being, for example, Lebanese German, and he has a Lebanese name, and he um, um, and they both apply for the same job and they have the same experience, same similar grades, that the person who is German is most more likely to get the job than the Lebanese person. Uh, that's also that's true for most foreign sounding names in Germany. And it's especially true when you set a picture of your uh, of yourself, especially when you're black. And this is an issue which is hard to advocate for in politics, because most people who aren't deep into that don't understand the problems that come with it. And, and I think that's also the problem of the whole movement, because how do you make huge demonstrations and call for liberation and then you talk about application processes and um or um things like a lot of um especially uh big issues that surround black people in germany also very intertwined with things that um are um which um affect for example refugees or other immigrants because germany also like a big part of the black population is also refugees from Somalia, for example, or Ethiopia. So a lot of issues that um, um, affect them are not necessarily issues that affect other black people in Germany, but for example, Syrian people in Germany. So, but I'm also glad that Black Lives Matter in Germany was also all encompassing and also advocated for refugees and uh, other immigrants. Um, but these are then, also separate issues, also issues like refugees in which Germany sort of always tilts a bit more to the conservative side of not taking many refugees and not giving out that much money. And um, yeah. Yeah, I think that like, this is not the same extent in the US, but I know that there's definitely uh, like when like for college applications, I remember applying to college and a lot of people that I know would like say like yeah if you have like a name that doesn't sound I don't this sound, like sounds like you're any like ethnicity or race that's like not white basically then you're less likely to get into certain colleges based on application things um, so I know that that's a thing in the U.S. but I don't know I know you, you don't have to put race or like I think Denise said in Greece you have to put like marital status or something like, you don't have to do any of that I don't think uh, or they can't see it or something yeah but definitely not to the same extent. But that's interesting, definitely. Pat, do you want to introduce yourself? And um, yeah. Um, so my name is Pat. I grew up in like DC, Maryland area. I'm not sure if you're familiar, <laughs> probably not. But uh, uh, so I grew up like 15 minutes after DC. And uh, my family's from Poland. So my parents immigrated from Poland in 2000 and I was born in 2002. So I grew up going to Poland every year and speaking Polish and kind of more Polish culture wise than like uh, like American culture, if that makes sense. Although I grew up in America, so it's kind of like a weird uh, thing. Um, but uh, what else? Um, yeah, it's kind of like, so then I came to Davidson which is like, like totally kind of different. I went to, so I went through public school. <laughs> this is complicated. I, I don't know if I'm explaining my story well right now, but uh, so I went to private school in high school, which is a really different experience for me than I went to public school throughout before that. And that's because I wrestled. So, and that was just like a whole different kind of community and like meeting a lot of like, uh, people who are like truly like American like have like heritage and stuff like that which is like new to me because I was like really exposed to that when I was younger um and then also having like the idea of like I'm like pretty European as well so um I don't know what else to say about myself I'm, I'm a physics major I'm actually thinking about going to Korea as well so I, I might do an internship there this summer so it's interesting uh, you sharing about Korea in Busan. So like 
on the other side. I don't know if you visited that area of Korea, but um, I'll, I'll be that'll be my first time going to any kind of a, like Asian country as well. So I would I I feel like I might uh, <laughs> relate to some some of that like what you experienced. Um, but yeah, that's kind of my story in, in the short. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Pat. Um, yeah, uh, Pat is is doing some work right now. He's um, writing some music uh, for us as well. You forgot that part that you're writing music and working on poetry um, and also looking into uh, subjects related to uh, uh, Black uh, Poland as well in, in the auspices under the, the umbrella of our class. So yeah, awesome. Uh, Danai, do you wanna introduce yourself? Sure. Um, hi, I'm Danai, I'm from Greece. Um, I came in the US when I was 18, to then Davidson. I went to farming high school before that. Um, I'm a biology major and German studies major. And thanks for sharing all your experiences and I felt that I was able to relate to some of them, especially the not I shouldn't call them microaggressions, like some things that would seem really odd for the US, like asking for a picture in your resume or asking for your height when you apply for a job or asking for marital status. So things that do sound very weird for people who are used to very liberal practices here in the US. To me, they sound just normal because I was raised in that and then coming to the US, I was like, whoa, that's another world. Um, so I'm not sure if that's sad because <laughs> I think it kind of is because it's time for like the rest of the world to also kind of follow um, these steps, going to like seeing people more as people and not as numbers. But yeah, that's all for me. Thank you, Denai. Um, and Janai is a German German major and a senior a senior this year. Oh my God, I'm getting old. All right, and Kari, can you introduce yourself? Yeah. Um, so hi, I'm Kari. Um, I'm a sophomore at Davidson, and I'm studying economics. I think you said that you're studying economics. Um, and I'm from Portland, which is on the other side of the country. Um, it's really far away. Um, but I've had a really interesting um, school experience, kind of not similar, but there's touches that are similar. I was in a Japanese immersion program um, growing up from kindergarten. So I've been speaking Japanese since kindergarten. And then we've gone over to um, Japan a couple of times. Um, and, you know, you get stopped on the streets for pictures and people like to touch your face and stuff. Um, even in like the bigger cities like um, Kyoto and um, Hiroshima and stuff, which is, you know, quite different than um, my experience in the US. Um, and then I started um, taking German in high school because my family's German. My dad moved here when he was eight um, from uh, Austria and my um, grandmother's from East Berlin. So there's quite a bit of international background there. Um, so kind of similar to Pat, I was like pretty, in, my family is, um, loves Germany and is very proud of their German heritage. So I was pretty enthralled in uh, like traditional German upbringing, I guess. Like we have to sing Christmas carols before we open presents on um, Christmas day in German and um, have to go to like <laughs> um, Austrian like festivals and stuff in Portland, which is absolutely bizarre because there's not a large um, German population, German or Austrian population in Oregon. Um, it's like pretty just American. I don't know. Um, actually, there's a large Asian influence in um, Portland where I'm from. But yeah, so I've had like a lot of different mixes. My grandma or my mom is also, um, she went to high school in Singapore. So uh, that adds like another twinge of just interesting stuff. She's actually South African, not even Singaporean. Um, so there's lots of different um, international backgrounds um, in my life. So I've loved um, being able to come to Davidson and then further like 
my love for different cultures and learning about how different people live their lives in like a class like this um, where we learn about um, Black German studies and stuff like that. So, yeah. Awesome. You guys are, I mean, it just astounds me how international um, y'all are. Uh, I mean, literally, in many ways, like, I, I didn't even know that about your mom, um, Kari, that's wonder. that's so interesting, wonderful. And uh, some of the students who were not able to be here too have um, links to familial links to Germany, and um, other places in the world as well. So um, yeah, we've talked a lot about our identity as a class. Um, so we all um, th there's eight students in the class plus me, um, plus Dr. Pena, and you know nine out of the ten of us are white passing. Um, obviously, Dr. Pena being being the one black woman here, and what that has meant for how we can can talk about um, talk about and um, be involved in Black German studies and. Uh, yeah, so it's it's always interesting to learn that you know we all we all come from very different places and bring with us all of these different identities that then shape the way that we can um, interact with the, with the topics that we've dealt with in the class. Um, yeah, so I thank you all for introducing yourselves um, more broadly for our, our audience and, and for um, Basiro. Are there any other questions, anything else that um, either um, Masiru, you wanna talk to our students about or y'all wanna talk to, to him about? Uh, um, thank you for your uh, introductions. Uh, I think they're really, really interesting um, as to some of them. For example, um, I, can, I can really recommend Busan. I was there twice. It's really, really warm compared to Seoul, it's it's also distinctively more culturally Korean than Seoul is, as Seoul is more Christian and international, Busan is more Buddhist and traditional. And um, yeah, I also thought it was interesting that you mentioned something about um, Black people in Poland. Um, my parents knew a few Senegalese people in the 90s who um, who, because Senegal used to be a socialist country, as Poland was, so there were many um, Black students in Poland before the, um, the Eastern Bloc fell down, and they got to know a few uh, Senegalese people who studied in Poland, and who, after the Berlin Wall fell, my parents always told me that it was impossible to live in Berlin because all the people from Eastern Berlin came to Western Berlin because they didn't have like big supermarkets and they never, they didn't even know what capitalism was. And they also in Germany, there's always this joke about uh, Eastern Germans not knowing what a banana is <laughs> because apparently they didn't have bananas in Eastern Germany. And also after a few months, also many people from Poland and Romania and Hungary came to Western Berlin because they were then allowed to travel a bit. And these Polish, uh, these Senegalese people used to come to Western Berlin, buy a lot of stuff and then go back to Poland and sell them there, uh, which I thought was a very interesting uh, businessy story. Um, um, yeah, I think it must be really hard to um, grow up at some part in, in, in another country and then moving so fast in, in another, because when I came to, South Korea, for example, I knew I was not going to stay there for long. It was one year I'm not going to stay there for the rest of my life or a big um, chunk of my life. And I was already, I was, I was 19. I already had, did high school. I, I had all my education in Germany. So for me, it was probably a bit more uh, easier than for some of you with coming to America or uh, with uh, foreign parents. So I really respect that. And it's really interesting. Thank you. It's funny you mentioned uh, like people bringing back stuff and selling it. My dad used to actually do that. <laughs> he, would, he would even, uh, when we first moved to uh, America, he would like bring stuff from America uh, 
back to Poland and sell it. And then he would buy like Polish sausages and bring it to America and sell it. <laughs> One time uh, he got he got stopped on like the, in the airport because the dogs were like following him because he had sausages <laughs> in his bag. So <laughs> that's pretty funny. I can relate to that because my mom used to do that between Senegal and Germany for a time. And by the way, I also thought it was really interesting with all the um, um, international backgrounds because I always thought I was very international because, I mean, I am, but also uh, an experience I made when I was in South Korea in the private school was that like we had, for example, a kid, his father was from Guatemala, but his grandparents from Germany and Italy and his mom is half Chinese, half Korean. And I asked him once, because like he did, I knew he didn't have a Korean citizenship. I was like, if someone asked you, where are you from? Where, what, where are you from? And he told me I'm a Guatemalan Chinese Korean German, <laughs> which I think is good for him because as I said before, I don't think much about the, I'm half this, I'm half this, because I mean, it's always hard to say because like, okay, I, I can see how some people say, for example, I'm not full Senegalese because I didn't um, have the full Senegalese experience, but there's no official Senegalese experience as there's no full Lebanese uh, or Japanese or um, Libyan um, way of life. Um, you, you get some, uh, for example, I always thought, okay, I'm more German than Senegalese, but then I remind myself since my parents are both Senegalese, I basically had the same upbringing as someone from Senegal, but in Germany. So it's it's more complicated than just saying 50-50. I mean, it can be more than 60-70. I mean, it doesn't have to be 100, if that makes any sense, right? Because if you eat, for example, um, I know this might be a bad example, but for example, California rolls sushi. I mean, it's still 100% sushi, but it's also 100% American if you know what I mean. <laughs> Do our students have any other questions they'd like to ask Basiru? I mean, I was gonna ask you, I know that you went to China like when you were in Korea, but is there like another reason why you wanted to do Chinese studies and not anything else in Berlin? Um, for me, it was more about, um, I really am interested in languages. And uh, as I went to Korea, of course, I learned a lot of uh, uh, Korean, uh, but I also didn't just go to China, I also went to Taiwan and they also speak Chinese. And I went to Hong Kong which is officially part of China, but culturally very different. And I also went to Singapore in which most of the population has a Chinese background. And I found that part of the world, especially because China is so huge. I mean, uh, South Korea, I think has a population of 50 million and um, the province around Shanghai alone has over 80 million, which is bigger than Germany itself. And it's just one province <laughs> uh, Well. I think China has now a population of 1.4 billion. Um, and I, th I, th I really like the, I'm really interested of course in politics and history. And I, I really like Chinese history and politics. And when I did my economic studies, um, I like them very much. I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't, how to say, I don't feel any regret. I mean, now I still do business as a minor, uh, which is half of it is economics and, um, I thought I wanted to do something additionally to something that has to do with economics or business, something about politics, something about history, about uh, geography and culture. I could have done, for example, political science, but I felt like that was too general. So I wanted to do something specific to a certain country. But of course, in outside of university, I mean, I do work for Africa Lex, uh, which has nothing to do with China or um, I'll still um, watch French news, 
um, also Senegalese news, which are mostly in French. And yeah, I, I think I could have done also another uh, major, but I felt like for me, when I went to China, I felt so alien and foreign that I wanted to study um, the country by itself. definitely cool i respect it a lot yeah and i mean um another thing um what you probably also some of you felt when you i guess some of you had english as a second language then when growing up is that the moment you get to know when you feel like okay i know english i mean yeah, um, is a moment when you realize, okay, I can now watch American TV shows, movies, I can watch American news, English news, Canadian news, Australian, I can read books and poems from New Zealand, from Jamaica, and it gives you so much space uh, to work with, uh, culturally, um, politically, historically, which you wouldn't have if you would only be constrained to one language. I guess you probably feel similar about German uh, because I mean German is not that small of a language and I, I felt like with Chinese it could be also very interesting because again one billion people speak the, over a billion people speak the language so there's also a lot to to sort of experience. Well, we can't, we can't thank you enough for joining us today and um, for being in conversation with us. This has been a very special way to end our class, I think. And I think um, also a, 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 great, a great connection that we've made with you. Um, and hopefully some of us will be in Berlin in the spring um, following the, the next class. Uh, that Dr. Pena and I are co-teaching. And so we hope to be in connection with you um, in collaboration with you then as well. Um, so thank you again. And thank you all again for sharing, um, sharing your own experiences, your time, your energy, all of that um, this, this semester and today and always. So I'll add my thanks, Basiru, for joining us this morning. And as always, we're grateful to Davidson College for continuing to support these invaluable conversations. Emily and I appreciate the opportunity to share this space with such amazing human beings whose thoughtful participation this semester has helped us to consider and hopefully model for others new ways of thinking about and relating to others whose life experiences and cultural expressions may be different from our own. We've explored many aspects of Black German art and resistance and will continue to add new voices to our rapidly expanding repertoire. I sincerely hope and believe that all of our lives have been enriched by this unique classroom experience this semester and that we will each take away something perhaps unnameable in this moment, that will help us to be kinder, more insightful people. Perhaps you have too, or will, as you view all of the recordings in our series. It is imperative that we note here how incredibly privileged we are to be having these conversations, and that we are especially indebted to our students for allowing us to share them with you. We look forward with great anticipation to their final projects, which, will soon, which we will soon highlight on our newly renovated website for your inspiration and further enrichment. Please stop by bghra.org, bearing in mind that we are still in the throes of housekeeping since our recent redesign. We hope you like it and will return often. Follow us on Eventbrite, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to learn about our upcoming events in the All Black Lives Matter series. We will soon be announcing our public lectures and film screenings for December and January that I promise you won't want to miss. Our YouTube channel hosts all of the recordings from earlier episodes in the All Black Lives Matter series and from our four international conferences. Today's conversation will soon be among them. 
Mark your calendars for February 17th to the 20th, 2022, when we will host the fifth BGHRA conference virtually, hosted by Africana Studies at Rutgers University, Camden. We hope that you've enjoyed today's class as much as we have, and until next time, we thank you for your time and attention. Enjoy the rest of your day.